The hall of the inn is a pandemonium of shouts and screams. No one saw exactly what happened. It was so sudden, and the room was so crowded. The hall was so smoky and so noisy that even those who had been watching hadn't seen everything. Those inside the inn, rushing to get out, collide with guards stationed outside, trying to get in. On the ground is the reason for this panic. Lying in a rapidly spreading, rapidly cooling pool of blood, with a cheap dagger in his heart, is the second most powerful man in Three Kingdoms. Depending on who you asked, he was the most powerful. Accusations rang out, the man's subordinates and clients demanding answers. Who has done this? Where did they go? Who saw something? Orders were given to send out riders, to tell the king, to tell everyone, to lock down the city. The king was less than an hour away, but here confusion reigned. The men had gathered to fight in France, to depose the cardinal who ruled that kingdom from behind the throne. A cry rang out as a Huguenot there to meet with the dead man is spotted, taken up by the others. A Frenchman, a Frenchman! Perhaps he was responsible, perhaps he was an assassin, sent by Richelieu. He stammers out a denial, but the crowd is not to be sated. The situation could have easily ended with more bloodshed. But, at first unnoticed in the chaos, a man enters the hall from the inn's kitchen. He drew a sword and held it above his head, shouting, I am the one. I am the man that have done the deed. Let no man suffer that is innocent. Realisation gradually dawns on the crowd, and the man is rushed, seized, and disarmed. When searched, those who arrested him found two written statements sewn into his hat. He was a soldier, and a gentleman, the statement said, and he had given up his life and taken another for God, King, and Country. Roughly, the assassin is hauled out of the inn and taken to the jail. Within a day, he will be in the Tower of London for the murder of George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham and favourite of the King. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Episode 32 The Martyr Assassin. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. Last week, we saw Charles's third parliament get off to a good start, only to stall when the grievances that had dogged the Stuart monarchs for more than a decade reared their head. The Petition of Right was drawn up, which told the king exactly how much of a naughty boy he had been, but had little other effect. Charles received his taxation, But after the Commons returned their attention to the Duke of Buckingham and the King's own illegal collection of tonnage and poundage, he prorogued the Assembly. We left off with the Duke of Buckingham on the floor of Portsmouth's Greyhound Inn, with six inches of steel in his heart. Why had he been assassinated? And who had held the blade? The events immediately following the stabbing of Buckingham were, as I described in the opening. The assassin wasn't seized straight away, and he didn't try to escape. He had gone to the kitchen. This man was Lieutenant John Felton, and I have to wonder what was going through his head as the inn hall descended into chaos. Was he thinking of running? Was he trying to motivate himself to surrender? 
or was he resigned to his fate, as his statement described? There was a Frenchman in the inn, Monsieur Sobier, who was there to encourage the departure of the expedition. While Felton made up his mind, Sobier was suspected of carrying out the deed, but once Felton appeared, waving his sword, his fate was sealed. He was arrested and held in Portsmouth while the king was informed. As you might imagine, the death of the man who was like a second father to Charles, as well as close to a best friend as a king could have, hit him hard. Felton was ordered transported to London, where the truth of the matter would be wrung out of him. So, is this the first time on Pax Britannica where a conspiracy went off without a hitch? When someone didn't talk? Because as we know very well, someone always talks. In this case, that still rings true. Despite three months of interrogation, which included torture, Felton repeatedly denied that there was a conspiracy. He had acted alone, he said. The commission, established by the king within a week of Buckingham's death, investigated very thoroughly, chased down many spare leads, and reluctantly accepted that Felton was telling the truth. So who was Felton? And why did he want the Duke dead? Felton doesn't appear in the historical record until around 1625, when he signed up for the Cardi's expedition as a soldier. Whether he was one of those who got trashed on wine is unclear, but he survived that catastrophe and made it back to the British Isles. In 1626, he spent some time serving in Ireland under a Captain Lee, until Captain Lee's death. Felton then attempted to receive his late commander's position and attain a commission as a captain, but was denied. His luck wasn't much better when the time came for another expedition to the continent in Buckingham's attack of Ray. Felton attempted to be made a captain again in June 1627, and was again denied despite the efforts of some powerful friends. He wasn't even included in the initial expedition, and had to follow in the reinforcements. He arrived on the island of Ray in September, and he arrived with his old position of lieutenant. But he did so just in time for the fiasco that followed. Within weeks, Felton took part in the attempt to storm San Martin. He survived that, and the retreat that followed, but left with scars. Physically, he was wounded in his hand, but psychologically, he will have witnessed the slaughter of thousands of his comrades. He was not alone in blaming this fiasco on the commander of the expedition, the Duke of Buckingham. Felton returned to London after the expedition limped home, and stayed with his family for almost a year. Those who recalled the veteran spoke of him having a melancholy disposition and being of very few words. His sister spoke of him being haunted by dreams of fighting. Now, I'm not going to make any assumptions about Felton's mental state. It's hard enough to do that with sources this scarce, and I'm hardly qualified in any case. It does seem, however that his experiences at Ray, in Ireland, and at Cadiz had left an impression. Felton may have blamed Buckingham for the failures of both Cadiz and Ray. Many others did, after all, and they didn't lose friends and comrades due to his incompetence. But Felton had additional grievances against the Duke. He blamed him, personally, for blocking his advancement in the ranks. Felton was owed around £80 in pay, and Buckingham was duly blamed for that too. Repeated petitions to the Privy Council to resolve these grievances, to be paid for his service, and to be duly rewarded with promotion, were rejected. It was under these circumstances that Felton first read Parliament's remonstrance against the Duke. Felton's biographer, Professor Alastair Bellany, 
states that this document connected the dots for Felton. Now, he saw his experience as only part of a much larger list of crimes that the Duke was personally responsible for. On the 18th of August, a few days after Buckingham had arrived in Portsmouth, Felton resolved to become, quote, a martyr for his country, and kill the wicked Duke. For the next day, he said his goodbyes to his mother and sister, telling them that he was going to meet with Buckingham and convince the Duke to pay him his due. Just a few days later, Felton would be in the Greyhound Inn, where he would ram a dagger underneath the Duke's ribcage and into his heart. And the rest, as they say, is history. After his three-month stay in the Tower, on the 27th of November, Felton was brought to trial at the court of King's Bench. The Attorney General presided, and made his opinions very well known. Felton was, as Bellany puts it, a base, atheistical coward, and a disgrace to the profession of arms. The judgment was never in doubt. What doubts could there possibly be when you return to the scene of the crime, waving a sword, and declaring that you did it? Neither was the sentence. Death. And for the murder of the king's favourite, there was not a snowball's chance in hell of mercy. Two days after his trial, John Felton was taken from the Tower of London to Tyburn. On the scaffold, he confessed his crime and prayed for forgiveness. Then, he was hanged until dead. His body was then returned to Portsmouth, where it was displayed in chains until it rotted away. If Felton wanted to become a martyr, well, he got his wish. On his way to the tower, a woman had cried out, God bless thee, little David. While in the tower, his actions were toasted and cheered, his written statements copied and spread, reprinted into pamphlets. Bellany puts it nicely, quote, Toasts were drunk in Dover alehouses and Oxford butteries. Copies of Felton's hatband statements were passed from hand to hand. Stories of his words and deeds were exchanged in the streets or scrawled into newsletters. Dozens of poems celebrated his actions, hailing the melancholy, frustrated lieutenant as a patriot hero, God's agent, England's deliverer, another Phineas, another Ehud. Where the Duke was effeminate, cowardly, popish and corrupt, Felton was manly, brave, Protestant and virtuous. Even his torture and death was interpreted by the enemies of Buckingham as a positive thing. He had suffered as a martyr in the Tower. He had not meekly accepted his guilt on the scaffold, despite what multiple eyewitnesses said, but instead had chosen his final words to rail against the Duke and all of his minions. And the treatment of his corpse was actually an honour, with it being kept from the dirt and the worms, and kept in view of heaven. Bellany makes another interesting point regarding the sheer divide in official and public opinion on Felton's act. The public, or at least a substantial vocal portion of the public, celebrate the death of Buckingham and the actions of his killer. Charles, quite understandably, was horrified at this open praise of a treacherous murderer. Buckingham followed his killer back to London. He lay in state for a month while his funeral was prepared. On the 18th of September, he was interred in Westminster Abbey, in Henry VII's chapel. For Charles and his kingdoms, this was the end of an era. No other courtier would reach the heights of power and influence that Buckingham had attained. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. 
and I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So it's French for me in 2022, but like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and its bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code RecordedHistory. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com, code RecordedHistory. Babbel language for life. While Charles would never again have a courtier dominate his government the way that Buckingham had, there is no shortage of famous individuals who would take centre stage over the next decade. One of those will become particularly hated by Parliament, and he will have a central role in the outbreak of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. So, let's have a quick run through the life of William Lord, future Archbishop of Canterbury. Lord was born in 1573, in Reading, to fairly wealthy parents, and he entered St John's College, Oxford, in 1589 with a scholarship. He became a fellow of his college in 1593, graduated with his bachelor's in 1594, and returned for his master's in 1598. Three years later, he became a senior fellow, and two years after that, he was made a university proctor. All fairly impressive, but uncontroversial so far. Except it wasn't. Even this early in his career, Lord courted controversy. In 1602, he began a feud with another future Archbishop of Canterbury, George Abbott, after a dispute over the continuity of the Church. And I'll just say now, like when we discussed the Jacobean Church, I am not a divine, and my grasp of the minor and even major differences in theology is lacking. In 1603, Lord took on the role of chaplain to the Earl of Devonshire. This was a valuable feather in his cap, but it didn't take long for Lord to bring controversy to this position too. In 1605, he officiated the marriage of the Earl to Penelope, the former wife of Robert Rich. What made this controversial was that Rich was still alive, and because their divorce had come about because Penelope had had an affair with Devonshire. At the very least, this was an unpleasant situation, but it was also possibly illegal. The case even ended up in front of King James. Lord fairly quickly attempted to distance himself from the marriage, and published a paper countering the Earl of Devonshire's justification for the union, Lord had quite possibly written that justification, which goes to show quite how torn he was over this situation. No one would forget this event. Not Lord, and not his enemies. Every year, Lord marked the anniversary of the marriage with fasting and prayer, begging God for forgiveness. And even twenty, thirty years later, his enemies would bring this up as a sign of his ambition overriding his faith. From early in his career, Lord was slandered as a crypto-Catholic. After being publicly condemned by the Vice-Chancellor of Queens, Lord's reputation was so poor that commentators described him being ignored in the street for fear that those who spoke to him would be considered heretics too. The brother of George Abbott, Robert, 
a Regis Professor of Divinity, denounced Lord from the pulpit. What art thou, Romish or English, Papist or Protestant, or what art thou, a mongrel or compound of both? The other abbot, George, contested Lord's promotion to the presidency of St. John's in 1611, and that required the personal intercession of James to resolve the issue in Lord's favour. On Shrove Tuesday in 1615, Lord gave a sermon which was criticised for being either popery or Arminianism. Lord had, once again, taken aim at Presbyterians, ranking them alongside Catholics in their theological errors. Robert Abbott, again, denounced Lord in a Sunday sermon, and complained that he was disparaging England's theological allies on the continent and north of the border. Once again, the king had to become involved, and Lord's allies at court succeeded in winning James's favour. Robert Abbott was forced to apologise for his criticism. Now there's a term I don't believe I've used so far in Pax Britannica, Arminianism. We will look at it in more detail in a future episode, but the important thing to remember is that it was, at least in the controversies of Stuart Britain, opposed to Calvinism. This included so-called Puritans, the Reformists and Separatists in the Church of England, and the bulk of the Scottish Kirk. In 1616, Lord was appointed to the Deanery of Gloucester, and within a year he had caused yet another barrage of complaints when he moved the communion table. Lord was one of the clergy invited to join James on his 1617 return to Scotland, which possibly wasn't the most diplomatic choice. No surprise, Lord was singled out by the Scottish Kirk for his role in the Articles of Perth. Lord hardly attempted to ingratiate himself with his hosts, going out of his way to dress and act as he believed was spiritually correct. That is to say, not the way the Presbyterians did it. Lord went further, and after the Articles of Perth were finally ratified, told James the Kirk had to come even closer in line with the English Church. Somehow managing to survive his brush with angry Scottish priests and return to England in one piece, in 1621 he became the Bishop of St. David's. An account written after the fact by one of Lord's many enemies describes how James had opposed his promotion on account of his restless spirit, and that it was pushed through by Charles and Buckingham. But the legitimacy of this is debatable. Buckingham was soon to become Lord's patron and friend, but that doesn't appear to have happened at this stage. Besides, if James had opposed Lord's elevation, he had changed his mind within a year as he promoted him once again. And it's important to remember that this is written after the fact by one of Lord's enemies. After becoming Buckingham's chaplain, the two were inseparable. And with James's death in 1625, Lord's star only continued to rise. Within a week of James's death, Lord presented Buckingham with a list of Orthodox and Puritan clergy. After the death of the previous Dean of the Chapel Royal, Lord was given the position and promised further advancement, nothing less than the Archbishopric of Canterbury. The only problem was that it was still occupied, and occupied by none other than Lord's old foe, George Abbott. He would have to wait until 1633 for that promise to be fulfilled, but fulfilled it would be. For now, Lord was made the Bishop of London, and appointed to a commission to handle the responsibilities of the Archbishopric of Canterbury. Abbott had incurred the King's displeasure for refusing to support the forced loan of 1627, and so he was deprived of his functions. Lord had been a particular target of parliamentary antipathy since Charles came to the throne. This wasn't surprising. 
Not only were the commons full of those who disagreed with him on religious matters, but also with those who disagreed on political matters too. Lord was well known to be Buckingham's man, and he preached to Parliament in both 1626 and 1628 on the need for a strong monarchy in alliance with the Church. Moreover, Lord was not shy in defending Buckingham when Parliament went on the attack, writing speeches for both the Duke and Charles to give to the disgruntled assembly. His handiwork can be seen in Charles' response to a remonstrance in 1628, tactful, appealing for moderation and praising the rights of Parliament, but reinforcing the King's authority. Lord was named in one of the 1628 remonstrances as an Arminian, and he had apparently heard rumours that, when Parliament reconvened, he would be offered up as a sacrifice to the Commons to win more taxation. Charles reassured Lord that he had no reason to fear this fate until the king had sacrificed others. That's what we call foreshadowing. Lord was firmly on the side of strong monarchical rights. Taxation was a king's right, not something for the commons to sell, he wrote in 1627. In contrast to Parliament, Lord could list the times that kings had received taxation from the church. In 1628, Lord described Magna Carta as having, quote, an obscure birth by usurpation, and was fostered and showed to the world by rebellion. So he's not a fan, then. With Buckingham's assassination, Lord could have been in a precarious situation. The Duke had been his patron, and protected him from his many enemies. He was personally relatively close to Charles, but Buckingham had been the main link between them. With him gone, everything was at risk. But now, the king and the bishop shared a bond of loss. Charles had obviously cared deeply for Buckingham, and Lord wrote of the king's death as, the saddest news that ever I heard in my life. The two exchanged letters, and according to Lord's biographer, Professor Anthony Milton, Charles appears to have considered Lord's loss to be even greater than his. He showed him great sympathy when Lord returned to court two weeks after the Duke's death. Lord would become increasingly involved in Charles' religious policy over the next decade. In just a few months, Charles will begin the period of his reign known as his personal rule. But before we reach that, we have a parliament to finish. That will be in two episodes' time, as next week we have a special guest episode from the Industrial Revolutions podcast. Just before we finish, a gentle reminder to any listeners in the UK. Unless you've been living under a rock, in a cave at the bottom of Beaufort's dyke, you'll know that we have an election coming up. If you're eligible, or think you might be eligible, please make sure you register to vote. You can do it online, and it takes five minutes. The deadline is one minute to midnight on the 26th of November, so don't miss it. I'm not being sponsored or anything to say this, it's just, you know, voting is a very important right, and Parliament's come a long way from the one we're talking about now. It doesn't really matter to me who you vote for, only that you do vote. So, that's my little PSA. Hopefully it wasn't too annoying to listen to, especially to those listening after the election has been and gone, and presumably the monster-raving loony party has formed a government. Remember that you can find the show on Twitter and Facebook, and follow my personal Twitter, at SamuelHume10. Ad-free feeds are available to all patrons, and I appreciate everyone who takes the time to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you to my wonderful House of Lords, the Royal Headsman, executed today, Her Grace the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich, His Grace the Duke of Clarence, Rory Martin, the Most Honourable, Marchioness of Scullion, Lady Jennifer, the Right Honourable, Countess of Shrewsbury, Elaine Dickens, Countess of Surrey, Jean Buckley, Earl of Oxford, Christopher Grogan, Earl of Somerset, Brendan Bonner, Countess of Cornwall, Belinda Clarence, Earl of Hereford, Christopher Rema, Earl of Dunbar, Angus Wilson, Earl of Northumberland, 
Michael Thomas, the Earl of Southampton, Alan Goldstein, the Earl of Northampton, Justin Drowns, the Earl of Nottingham, John Toogood, the Earl of Leicester, Jim Du Bois, Stephen, Earl of Warwick, the Earl of Bradford, Richard Little, the Countess of Clarendon, Mandy Wright, David, Earl of Montgomery, the Earl of Derby, Jonathan Musselman, the Earl of Carlisle, Ian Leicester. Thanks again to my entire House of Lords, to Sounds Like an Earful for the music in today's episode, and to you for listening.